This episode is brought to you by Atlassian. Atlassian makes the team collaboration software that powers enterprise businesses around the world, including over 80% of the Fortune 500. With Atlassian's AI-powered software like Jira, Confluence, and Loom, you'll have more time to do the work that matters. In fact, Atlassian customers experience a 25% reduction in project duration per year. Unleash the potential of your team at Atlassian.com. Atlassian. Hello and welcome to Fintech Insider Insights. I'm David Barton Grimley, Fintech Strategy Director right here at 11FS. And in this episode, we are discussing the current state of fintech in Singapore. As we're recording this episode, Singapore is currently gearing up to host their annual fintech conference, the Singapore Fintech Festival, with over 60,000 delegates from over 150 countries expected to descend on the island country. Singapore's reputation as a global fintech hub has grown exponentially over the last few years. And we've noticed right here a big uptick in the amount of listeners based there too. And so that's why on this episode of Fintech Insider, we wanted to check in on what the most exciting developments happening in the Singapore fintech industry are and discuss what the future might hold for businesses and entrepreneurs working to build the next generation of financial services in the region. So, to do so, I'm joined by three fantastic Singapore fintech experts. First up, we have a warm fintech insider welcome to Anupam Pahuja, Executive Vice President and General Manager for APAC Middle East and Africa at NIAM. How are you, Anupam? Could you please tell us a bit about yourself um, and what you do at NIAM? Yeah, hey, Joel. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, my name is Anupam. Uh, I'm responsible for NIAM's business across uh, uh, Asia Pacific, Middle East, and Africa. It's about 150 countries. Um, the intent is to really focus on these uh, emerging geographies for the company uh, and take them to the next level of growth. Um, it's an exciting time, as you said, to be here in Singapore, a little red dot, uh, and uh, exciting things happening here, which I wish to discuss with you over the hour here. Amazing. And joining Anupam on the show today, we have Joel Leong, Chief Strategy Officer and Co-Founder of Aspire. Welcome to the show, Joel. Please tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and Aspire. Thanks, David. Um, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Joel. I was born, bred in Singapore uh, and have been a multiple time startup founder spanning the, the areas of financial services, payments, and before that, actually, uh, a couple of years in e-commerce. Currently, I lead strategy at Aspire. We are B2B-focused fintech and uh, working to build the future of banking for tens of thousands of modern-day business owners around the world. Awesome. And last by no means least, it's a warm welcome to Shadab Tayabi, president of the Singapore Fintech Association. Shadab, please do tell our listeners a little bit about the Singapore Fintech Association and what it is you do there. Thank you, David. First of all, pleasure pleasure to be here and, and thanks for hosting me. Um, the Singapore Fintech Association is the national industry association that represents the whole fintech ecosystem in Singapore. We have about 700 plus members um, across the whole ecosystem being fintechs, financial services institutions, as well as uh, service providers and law firms, consulting firms as well. Uh, my name is Shadat Tabi. I'm the elected president of the Singapore Fintech Association. Uh, uh, this is my fourth year as, as president of the association. Um, the job of the president is to chair the exco the executive committee and we work very closely with our members to make sure that we are helping them with a few areas specifically advocacy and business growth overall uh, we have a secretariat staff of about 15 people who run the operations of the uh, association as well and uh, as i said we represent the whole fintech ecosystem in singapore Awesome. All right, let's dive in. So to kick off the show in this first part, we're going to dig into why Singapore is such an exciting part of the world for fintech, the opportunities that the market offers, as well as how it competes with other parts of the world. So Shadab, I think it's, it makes the most sense to come to you first as president of the Singapore Fintech Association. Could you give us maybe just a bit of an overview of the current fintech landscape in Singapore? Uh, yes, David. Uh, I think before I go on to talk about the current landscape, let me just give you a bit of a history as well. So 
in Singapore, the fintech, the term fintech actually got coined uh, somewhere in 2015, started getting used in the more, I would say, uh, formal sense. Uh, when uh, our regulator, MAS, also set up the fintech innovation group within MAS, the central bank. And also we organized ourselves as the founder community to come together and form the National Industry Association, the SFA, the Singapore Fintech Association. At that time, uh, if you go back and look, there were about 100 plus companies uh, and with only $20 million of investment going into that. Now, fast forward that to where we are now, um, 2022, the official figures were about 1,500 companies, 1,500 companies uh, FinTech in Singapore with over 4.2, 4.1 US dollar, uh, 4.1 billion US dollars of investment going into these companies. So the the, uh, the segment has grown uh, vastly. And if I look at some of the uh, numbers that have come out in that recent, uh, recently released FinTech State of Play report, the average age of uh, the 150 plus companies that we sampled is about 5.5 years. And 54% of these companies are in the payments, Web3 and RegTech space. Of course, uh, I'm joined by my, my colleagues from the ecosystem, uh, Niam and Aspire being uh, some one of the, uh, like, Two of the very big names in our in our ecosystem who have who have grown in Singapore ecosystem altogether. Amazing! It's, it's just such huge growth um, over there. I mean, you, you mentioned a few kind of subsectors within within fintech. Is there any particular sector you would say that has grown the most? I mean, I, I know like Web three is also pretty pretty big out there as as well. It's it's payment that has always led mm. uh, in terms of the size, and I thought it has grown across as well overall, and it still remains the biggest sector as far as the number of companies that are dabbling in it as well. And the majority of the companies has also grown in the payment space altogether. Um, there's a there's a lot to do with uh, the way the regulations have also evolved, and the regulations have been laid out as well. So one thing I want to highlight as well is that. The, the collaborative regulator that we have, our central bank MAS, they came up with the uh, PSA, the Payment Services Act, back in 2019. And one of the key things it did was it made it an activity-based regulation altogether. So seven types of activities regulated, no matter whether you're a financial institution or a five-member uh, new startup in payment, as long as you were uh, participating in an active regulated activity of the type that you were in, you could be regulated for that. And of course, the same regulations apply. So, so that has been one of the key, I would say, enablers and 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 it has created a lot of and provided a lot of help in the growth of this ecosystem altogether. And of course, uh, our payment subcommittee that uh, that we have formed at SFA, the Singapore Fintech Association, we, we have been able to uh, put the right level of feedback and 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 our and our support back to the uh, regulator and the policymakers as well in terms of uh, providing the right level of uh, feedback. Anupam, I'm going to come to you on that point. It's it's so interesting, and this is something we hear a lot that MAS is just so way ahead um, of many other regulators in the world and making it very easy to situate in Singapore. I mean, as a global business, Anupam, that's sort of headquartered in in Singapore. Why why Singapore? Yeah, for I, I think uh, Shadab talked about the fact that we have a very uh, friendly, forward-looking uh, regulator. Uh, that's one part of it. But we also have an entire ecosystem of government-led bodies that help us. So as an example, if you're a foreign company wanting to enter Singapore, you have the Economic Development Board of Singapore, EDB, that'll help you. Um, you know, we are a Singaporean homegrown company. We have some uh, something called Enterprise Singapore, which helps us. Uh, so these government bodies, when they come together, it's not just the regulator that's providing the appropriate regulations for you to thrive in, but also the entire ecosystem of the government structure that comes together to help you move forward. Uh, that is sort of what is key for our success in my view. In addition to that, I think uh, there's a thriving ecosystem um, with each company really helping each other. So if you look at Joel's company here, um, Aspire, they have a founders event that happens, um, you know, uh, literally every month. They bring all the founders together, they, they, they put the people together and help them really understand the nuances of growing. Uh, we also have companies uh, that help each other from a 
uh, from a working together perspective. As an example, uh, Neom uh, powers Aspire's, uh, some of Aspire's products, right? So it is a, it is a very symbiotic relationship, uh, not just uh, from, a, uh, from a governmental regulatory perspective, but also from an ecosystem perspective and also from companies coming together uh, to help grow the pie for each other. Joel, do you want to come in on that? I mean, how has how has the Singaporean government and structure there helped you and uh, Aspire grow? Yeah, no, I, I totally echo Sharab and Anupam's points. I think one of the, the the things that Anupam was mentioning that I like to further elaborate on is, you know, aside from the the direct government bodies that uh, enable us to do what we do, but there's also the the foundation that the government has set up with Singapore being a you know, pro-enterprise, pro-innovation hub, the stability of the country, right? Uh, and the ability to attract talent pools to, to, to this location, to, to this island out of nowhere, um, has, has definitely been a, a draw, uh, for, you know, whether it's fintech or, or tech at large. Um, and, and I think the other advantage that we have as a, a country is, you know, the, the global connectivity that we have for, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, businesses, uh, consumers, it, it, Singapore is very well situated as a hub uh, that, that can be a springboard for a lot of new businesses, new fintechs uh, to access Asia, right, and beyond. Awesome. I'd, I'd love to take a little step back, actually, and, and talk a bit about SingPass. So SingPass as a, you know, government ID system, highly secure, government-backed, um, connecting citizens to government services and financial institutions through a very centralized, highly digital identity system, let's let's say, is very often held up as, a, as an exemplar. I mean, we talk about it uh, so much uh, on the podcast um, on Fintech Insider. It comes across so much on venture theses as, you know, you know, we need identity systems that work a little bit like this in order for our fintech ecosystem to to thrive. I'd I'd love maybe to come to you, Shadab. You know, how, how much has how much of a factor has SingPass been to help, you know, fintechs launch and, and also scale? No, absolutely. I think having a government backed uh, EKYT solution definitely has helped uh, the growth of these fintechs and also to have one less thing to worry about to start with um, altogether. So overall, I think uh, uh, as far as some of the numbers go, some of the stats go, Syncpath has uh, you know been able to uh, create that transactional capability with private sector organizations, uh, 460 plus government agencies, and it has uh, it provides access to over 1,700 services. So that's like servicing and being able to uh, to uh, so approximately 97% of the Singapore citizens and PRs aged uh, who are aged above 15. This is like, uh, if you look at some of the other stats, it's like facilitating 300 million personal and corporate transactions every year. So, so these these are these are not small numbers, and it has really enabled some of the uh, really uh, you know uh, value added services that some of these fintechs are trying to provide. Uh, they do not have to worry about the EKYC element, and that gets. Uh, get them to market. The GTM can be uh, quite quite short and quite relatively cheaper as well. So ThinkPath has definitely played a very important role. A version of that, of course, is the MyInfo, which enables the pre-filled digital forms as well uh, with their personal data from government sources for online transactions. That that has also helped, uh, you know, in, in significant cost cost savings uh, for you know companies which are getting into the the space. Uh, on the customer acquisition uh, process, because customer acquisition can be quite costly, and these have really helped uh, with, with with those companies in that aspect. So um, I want to go back to what Anupam was saying earlier as well. That it's it, it's not just that government aspect of it as well. It's it's a lot of collaboration that that companies have come in together to support that has helped grow the, the ecosystem. But these are some of the uh, very clear initiatives, and I would say. Uh, like forward sightedness of the organ of the uh, government here that they've been able to put these public infrastructures in place at the right times to to ensure yes Anupam. yeah shut up I, I think great point I also wanted to add we talked about uh, saying pass which is great for EKYC for individuals but we also have something similar for companies 
uh, we have the Acra system as well, right? So um, it, a lot of us, like I, I, we are a B2B player and an ability to our KYC or KYB uh, business is equally important for us. And we're able to do that electronically. Uh, so the government has figured out that it's not just about the consumers, but businesses also need to move payments around the world and are providing the toolkits necessary for you to be able to do it in a way that's uh, you know very quick and efficient. It's amazing. And business to business payments is just such a huge underserved um, segment segment of the market. Um, and so few governments have figured out how to do that that KYB. I mean, Anup- Anupam, you, you raise a really interesting um, point. Um, and also, you know, you as, as Neom is a global organization, you say head, headquartered in, in Singapore. What is the story about scaling from Singapore across APAC? So, you know, you've got these great services in Singapore, like, like you know, SingPass, for example, but, you know, Singapore, small country, right? Red Dot, I think, as one of you said, it's got 6 million people, um, but the population of the wider APAC region is something like 4.7 billion people, right? So that's 60% of the world's total total population. So how, how does situating in Singapore help you scale to those to those countries? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, from, from our perspective, first of all, Asia has 70% of the world's population in it. And it's not a homogeneous country or, or a continent. You know, different stratas of income, uh, different races, uh, different geopolitical uh, sort of events, right? Um, and so it's nothing. It's the most heterogeneous environment anybody could have ever seen. However, uh, being in Singapore allows uh, multiple uh, different advantages for companies like ourselves. First of all, it's a stable government. It's um, very easy to do business here. The language of business is English. Uh, the way uh, to get things done, as we just talked about, is extremely efficient. Um, you know, within an hour of Singapore, you can go to one of the most populous countries in the world, whether it's in, not hour, let's say a couple hours. You can go to India, you can go to China, you can go to Indonesia. Uh, and these are just, you know, literally a hop, skip, and a jump away. So you have an ability to live and work in an environment that is very safe, uh, that is very efficient, and is very convenient to use to start up your businesses, right? And then from there, you can be a, your jumping off point to all these geographies around Asia. So to us, that convenience and ease of doing business is what attracts us to be here. Now, by no means, Singapore is a cheap country, right? If you want cheap yeah. labor, you can go to countries like India, et cetera, et cetera. But if you want all the other things that are necessary, right, to to really build a thriving business, uh, regulatory frameworks, I just talked about a whole bunch of different things, then Singapore is the place to be. Joel, how do you think about scale? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think we're, you know, we, we kind of are in the same boat as our customers, right? So we, we serve small, medium businesses. Uh, we are obviously headquartered here as well. Uh, but I, I think how, how I would uh, encapsulate the mindset is that um, Singapore is a fantastic place to start. Like Anupam said, it's a great spring, springboard. But I think the mindset has to be going global from day one. Like you have to think global from day one. And, you know, this is a great place to, you know, be a HQ, uh, sort of manage, you know, the region. But I, I think, uh, like you rightly pointed out, um, at the end of the day, it's, it's a small uh, country. It's, it's a limited economy. So when you look for larger attempts, you, you, you need to think global. Um, and that, that's how we think about it. That's how, you know, we, we also uh, build for our customers, right? These aspiring businesses uh, so, so that they can access the rest of the world really easily with the, the financial services that we provide them. If I may just add to that, uh, um, I think a uh, uh, very pertinent uh, point to understand that uh, the domestic market is only relatively limited here in that space just because of the sheer size. So if I look at the ecosystem as well, easily above 60% of, of the uh, fintech companies in Singapore are B2B fintech companies uh, just because of the nature of it. And like Anupam and Joel have highlighted, there are certain reasons why it's easier and more efficient to sort of run your business out of here, uh, even though you're serving other markets. And there are many examples of the Singapore born on based Singapore fintech companies who have offices and are operating in uh, B2C markets in other countries right right from here. 
So that, that's an important element. And in order for that to happen and for, for, for some support as well, I mean, of course, uh, Neom and Aspire are, are of, of, a, of a sizable, I mean, they are already of a, of a relatively big size now, but bring it down to the real startups and the scale-ups uh, within our ecosystem. One of the things that we do in collaboration uh, uh, with the uh, enterprise SG body, like bodies like enterprise SG, is to run these mission trips as well. And these are specifically catered to helping uh, create business opportunities and also expansion opportunities in terms of working with trusted service providers in the countries of target as well. Like for example, this year, we've already done five mission trips. Last year was also five mission trips, including to the UK. and. One of the key tenets of that was how many of those fintech companies have actually expanded and set up offices. For Australia, we did a very targeted pilot approach, which is six companies went in uh, for a 10-day period which, who already had plans to expand in those countries and uh, in, in Australia, and they were able uh, to get their businesses set up, four of them out of the six. So these are some of the examples where the ecosystem comes together, including with government support, to help our companies expand outside of Singapore as well. Yeah, it's like you're baking in expansion as a as a, a factor of setting up in Singapore, which is brilliant. Sorry, someone wanted to come in. No, I was just wanted to add, I mean, these mission trips and, and the benefits per ESG provides to Singaporean companies is just immense. Uh, just a case in point, we just had a mission trip to Saudi Arabia. Uh, our team returned from that. And as a result of that, um, during Singapore FinTech Festival, we have the SAM on the Central Bank of Saudi Arabia coming uh, to Singapore where we get to meet them on a more uh, sort of uh, exclusive basis to really get them to look at our products. This would not have been possible had ESG not opened the doors for us through this mission trip in Saudi Arabia. So our team went there. We met with a whole bunch of uh, uh, different regulators, we met with uh, different clients, and then uh, continuing that discussion now, uh, and very close to now therefore opening an office in Saudi Arabia. And and that's thanks to the ecosystem for Singapore. Otherwise, we wouldn't even know where to get started. Yeah, absolutely. Let's let's um, close this segment on funding, because, you know, at the end of the day, you got to raise money. And you, you know, you need to be in a in a country or an ecosystem that has the the VCs there to give you that money. So, you know, let, let's take a look at some of the stats. In H1 of 2024, Singapore's fintech sector saw a 19% increase in deal activity. So that's 117 deals, despite a 34% decline in total investment to roughly half a billion US dollars. The cryptocurrency and blockchain segments led funding growth, which is actually really, really interesting, with a 22% rise to about $200 million um, across 72 deals. So if you just compare that to the global context, fintech investments fell to $51 billion uh, in, in H1 2024. So I think it's fair to say that Singapore is kind of outperforming that, that, that global trend. I mean, Joel, I, it, just, it makes sense to come to you, you know, as a, as a co-founder and as someone whose company has raised funding. Like, how, how have you found it in Singapore and how would you say that differs to some other countries? Yeah, no, I, look, I, I think Singapore is probably one of the top three places to raise money in APAC, right? It's, it's a strong financial hub. It's got global investor coverage. I think some things that we talked about earlier on where, uh, you know, there's a structurally sound legal system. There's a government push uh, that con continues to attract investors around the world uh, with a very wide range as well. Let's not forget, like, you, you know, you have uh, anything ranging from your family offices to your institutions. Uh, so I, I think that sort of uh, sets a very good platform, right, for, for businesses to raise here. Um, and, and I would say that, the, you know, like we touched upon earlier, I think the challenge here comes a little bit more from an execution standpoint. How do you get beyond mm. the initial market? But from a fundraising standpoint, I think, uh, you know, Singapore is a, a very bright spot, like you mentioned. Amazing. You guys are all, uh, you, you're selling it. I'm, I'm ready to move. <laughs> move back, I should say. I was actually born in Singapore. But that's a story we'll pick up later. <laughs> now, we're going to go to a quick pause before we dive into the future of fintech in Singapore. It's all coming up after this super quick break, so don't go anywhere. Are you struggling to close deals? B2B selling is tougher than ever. And that's why we want to tell you about LinkedIn Sales Navigator. LinkedIn's Sales Navigator is a sales intelligence platform 
that helps professionals effectively prospect and engage high-value customers, drive higher revenue, and increase sales performance. Sales Navigator helps you target the right buyers, surface key signals such as job changes or which accounts you should prioritize, and shows you hidden allies so you can find those buyers who are most likely to convert. Fueled by LinkedIn's 1 billion member platform, Sales Navigator gives you the most up-to-date first-party data, enabling you to unlock conversations with the people who matter. Right now, you can try LinkedIn Sales Navigator and get a 60-day free trial at linkedin.com slash fintechinsider. That is linkedin.com slash fintechinsider for a 60-day free trial. Let LinkedIn Sales Navigator help you sell like a superstar today. Just go to linkedin.com slash fintechinsider and get started. Whether you're starting or scaling your company security program, demonstrating top-notch security practices and establishing trust is more important than ever. Vanta automates compliance for ISO 27001, SOC 2, GDPR and more, saving you time and money while helping you build customer trust. Plus, you can streamline security reviews by automating questionnaires and demonstrating your security posture with a customer-facing trust center, all powered by Vanta AI. Over 7,000 global companies like Atlassian, Flow Health and Cora use Vanta to manage risk and prove security in real time. Our audience gets a special offer of $1,000 off Vanta at vanta.com forward slash insider. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com forward slash insider for $1,000 off. All right. Welcome back to Fintech Insider Insights, where we're delving into all things fintech in Singapore. So, so far, we've looked at what makes Singapore an attractive place to build and expand to. Now let's take a look at what the future might look like for this exciting fintech hub. So I think the first trending topic that we should talk about is wealth. So globally, you know, wealth tech or wealth in fintech is growing like the clappers. I mean, I think it's one of the biggest kind of VC trends that we see. And I think we've got to start off with the fact that Singapore has a hell of a lot of wealthy people. Um, so Singapore has something like more than 240,000 resident millionaires, which considering the size of the population is just phenomenal. And the number of ultra high net worth individuals with assets of more than something like $30 million is forecast to grow by 33% um, by 2025. So this is by far and away the fastest pace of any country in the world. Uh, Shadab, have you seen a an increase in kind of wealth tax wanting to situate in Singapore? Um, and, and yeah, is that growing there? Yes, absolutely, uh, uh, David. I think to, to, Singapore has always had, uh, you know, since the beginning of the uh, fintech journey for us, we've had many wealth tech players uh, come up as well. And majority of them, uh, of course, you know, the, the focus is either providing access to new products and services, uh, which are not being offered, or also to and also to cre- uh, broaden the access as well by lowering the minimums that is required for more uh, exotic products like alternative assets and so on as well. So, if you look at the overall wealth tech space, uh, we've got robo advisory players who, such as Indawa, Stashaway, Sai, some of the very common B two C robos, uh, who have also expanded their business in terms of the uh, shelf breadth of the shelf that they have of the products, and also you know uh, broadening it to even providing trading services in, in addition to the wealth management services as well. Then there are players who are actually uh, providing access to let's say corporate bonds. So uh, Bond Blocks is an example which offers fractional bonds as well, uh, or fractional corporate bonds. Uh, there are players such as Alta who are also providing uh, access to alternative investments and private assets. ADDX is another example. There are many players in this space who are, like I said, either providing access to new types of products or services or lowering the access to uh, accredited investors to be able to go into more exotic wealth products as well. But overall, it's a lot of them, uh, you know, most of them actually would be working closely with the incumbent financial institutions as well uh, because, you know, they may have certain regulations they may be regulated for certain activities, but they may be needing the reg- uh, the uh, other regulated financial institutions to provide them the full access. Hope that you're right. Yeah, 
Yeah, you're, you're right. Wealth of uh, of all of the fintech themes is the one that requires probably the most collaboration with a with a variety of incumbent financial institutions. And, and maybe I'll just open it up to Joel and Anupam. I mean, how how have you found or you know working with um, incumbent financial institutions in in Singapore? Is there a, is there a willingness to collaborate, or is it is it quite difficult? Um, sure. Uh, maybe I can start first. Um, and then Joel, you can add to it. Uh, look, there, there is a, there is a desire for, um, so first of all, just a little bit about NIEM. Uh, NIEM, uh, helps large businesses, enterprises, and financial institutions move money across borders. Uh, that's, that's the, the basis, uh, for NIEM. As such, our clientele is indeed financial institutions and large companies, uh, you know, including, uh, Joel's company, as I mentioned before, right? Um, and so, uh, is there collaboration happening? The answer is absolutely uh, yes. Uh, and I feel that these companies tend to be more forward-looking than some of the other geographies that we serve. Um, you know, I think partly because I, I would argue uh, Singapore, uh, given the stature that we talked about in terms of wealth, in terms of safety, in terms of government looking forward, uh, already has an understanding of what is possible and what we should do. It's not mired by, uh, you know, having to worry about uh, upliftment of masses, worried about getting food and shelter for people, which a lot of other Asian economies are dealing with, right? So uh, the, the companies that we deal with tend to be forward thinking and therefore open to new ideas and new ways of doing things because sort of mass lost hierarchy of needs, if you will, right? The basic needs have really been fulfilled and therefore they're willing to do more uh, on top. Uh, sort of my view of, of the company is typically in Singapore. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think, you know, we, we experienced firsthand um, sort of the, the cooperation or, or willingness uh, with these forward-looking institutions, right, that, that uh, want to power uh, the, the future of, of payments. Uh, so I, I think there are a lot of, um, you know, big financial institutions in Singapore, uh, a lot of the banks that we work with uh, that have taken this forward-looking view uh, compared to you know uh, other geographies like like Anupam has, has mentioned uh, you know today we cooperate with with the likes of uh, you know a couple of tier one banks in 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 the country uh, and uh, you know with the likes of Visa or Master uh, to to create a, a solution that then is packaged uh, to the customer and if you if you look at this. Uh, you know, cake that comes together, right? Everyone has a has a has a layer. They sh they they form the pie together. Let's let's stick with payments as a theme um, for the future. I mean, maybe Anupam, I'll come to you. Like, what are the what are the most exciting innovations in payments you're you're most interested in um, from a Singapore perspective or an APAC perspective? Let's say. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, certainly, uh, this is what we do for uh, for a living, and 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 I think the future is very bright. Uh, first of all, the market size for payments, global payments, about 150 trillion dollars. You know, we talk a lot about um, companies that are B two C type of companies, um, focused on merchant acquiring and such, Audien, PayPal, uh, Stripe, these kinds of typical kind of companies that come to mind. All of these companies are focused really on the $7 trillion market hand, right? Whereas if you look at B2B space, it's 150 trillion, it's massive. Um, and, and, and within that aspect, very interestingly, what's happening is most of, not most, but many countries have started their own instant payment systems. So if you look at India, which has got the largest instant payment system called UPI, which is run by the central bank, you have FAST in Singapore, you have PIX in Brazil, you have Boleto in Mexico, you know, Prompe in Thailand, et cetera, et cetera. These, all these countries have built their own instant payment systems, which enable the movement of money at a fraction of the cost and in real time. Now, the next obvious step is for this to then become global. How do we get instant payments to go from one country to yet another country? Singapore is very interesting in that aspect. They've started something called, or they're working on something called Project Nexus, uh, which is connecting the central banks and the instant payment system of multilaterally across Asia. So I think Thailand, Indonesia, Singapore, um, you know, I would argue India, I'm not really sure, but uh, are coming together to say, hey, listen, we should have it. We should enable the movement of money as easily as it is within the country through IPS. 
but to other countries as well. Uh, and, and, and Singapore is taking a front foot in this approach. Uh, up until now, it's been sort of bilateral uh, relationships, right? One country gets, the central bank gets together with another country's central bank. Hey, let's move money between our countries. But there is no multilateral, right? Out of the 190, 200 countries that are in the world, you cannot do bilaterals with each, right? So you have to yeah. build multilateral systems. And that's what Project Nexus is, is, is trying to do, which is, in my view, uh, led by and, and from Singapore. Uh, so very exciting uh, uh, way of looking forward. Uh, I think this B2B space is, is, is gigantic. Currently, the Nexus is focused on uh, consumers moving money. But as it comes to the B2B part, uh, very exciting times for us. What's the panel's view on stablecoins? I mean, is that something that you see taking off um, in APAC or is it still one to watch? I just saw a stat that um, a total payments in Singapore for stablecoins have recently hit about a billion about a billion dollars. But, you know, you know, if you put that in the perspective of the total amount of payments being done, I mean, that's like a rounding error, right? Maybe I can talk about it and maybe others can uh, uh, add on to it. Um, what little I do know. So... Uh, so if, if you want to move money using fiat currencies, what happens is typically there are blockages, meaning, you know, settlement happens uh, during nine to five banking hours, nine to, you know, uh, five days a week. Uh, with the likes of stablecoin, you you have an ability to settle, you know, 24 by seven, you have an ability to move the money. Uh, there are three key problems that most economies face when it comes to moving money. One is liquidity. Uh, you know, second, you know, sorry to say this is over dependence on U.S. dollars. Uh, liquidity, yeah. I mean, currency liquidity in the market. Indonesia, an example, has shortage of, let's say, U.S. dollars. How do you how do you move money around? Uh, second is really, uh, which I just mentioned, uh, the over dependence, in my view, at least, on on USD as a settlement currency across the world, right? And the third is fluctuation of currencies. Um, and if you do bring a uh, stable coin, you, you can build efficiencies, you can get away from these three challenges. So there is a great possibility uh, of doing things in a much more efficient way as we look into the future. How much of that will become real or will be allowed to become real, um, we will see as we move ahead. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know, it's exciting. Amazing. If I may just add to that, I think Singapore is one of the few countries who are actually uh, setting up the regulatory regime for uh, stable coins as well. In fact, last year at the Singapore FinTech Festival, which uh, by far is the largest global FinTech festival, um, uh, it was announced by MAS that the MAS regulatory uh, regime on uh, stable coins is up. And uh, there are two companies and three different uh, uh, sing single currency stable coins were given in principal approval as well, uh, Paxos and StraightX. So uh, maybe that's a good start to the to, to the building up of the ecosystem here, but uh, it, it's for all of us to see how how that evolves. Yeah, absolutely, Joel. I want I want to come to you. Um, I mean, there's lots of other things that that Singapore is is doing really well. I was just reading about AI, for example. Um, MAS has recently committed up to about a hundred hundred or so million dollars uh, to support quantum and, and AI capabilities. I mean, is that something you guys are, are looking to as as well in, in Aspire? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you know it, it's uh, it's something you you can't not look at these days. Uh, but but I think you know we we look at it in a way that is very uh, specific to the space that we play in, and and I think that's the way to to look at it generally, right? Because I I think there could be various applications of AI depending on which segment you serve uh, and which customer needs you're serving. For us, uh, because we serve SMBs, I think that the, the, the practical applications tend to be a little more in the back office function, right? As opposed to in the client facing function. So we have streams internally in, in terms of, you know, uh, powering our engineering needs or our onboarding capabilities, uh, fraud detection capabilities. Uh, that, that's where we see, uh, the, the ability to, to really leverage AI. But in, yeah. in larger larger companies, for example, we, we think that actually there could be a lot of uh, use cases uh, on the customer front. Yeah, that's the stuff still to be seen, right? Is the customer facing um, AI, which I think everybody is is sort of holding their breath and waiting for that financial institution that that almost dares to automate a uh, <laughs> a financial decision. 
Um, I want to I want to sort of close this podcast by talking about super apps. And super apps is another one of those themes, a little bit like AI, that that kind of. I don't know, sometimes it's a bit grown, everybody talks about it, and particularly everybody talks about it in relation to APAC, in relation to, you know, some countries specifically like Indonesia, like China, et cetera, et cetera. So without, you know, going too much about in, in the background um, of it, for those of our listeners who are not based in APAC, who doesn't know, so, you know, think about a super app as, you know, a collection of services and features under the umbrella of a single app. The kind of canonical example of that is Grab. Everybody talks about Grab as being that, you know, started off with um, taxi hailing and then kind of moved from taxi hailing into grocery deliveries and then into financing and embedded finance and everything like that. I think Grab now has something like 40 million monthly active active users. So it's huge. And in the UK, where I'm based, it comes up all the time. You know, fintechs and particularly the bigger scale-ups like Revolut, for example, are always thinking about how can we become you know, the grab, the super app. How can we in, encompass everything under our under our umbrella? What I'd love to do is kind of get a bit of a view from the panel here around where you think super apps and APAC are going. Is it a trend that is going to continue down that consolidation? Or actually, as you look into it, it might begin to atomize a little bit. I mean, if anybody wants to wants to jump in. All right, sure. <laughs> Um, the, so here's one person's view. Uh, so I feel you're right, right? There, the, you know, the world works in cycles, right? So, so there's consolidation and there's the centralization, consolidation, and then coming apart of things. Um, uh, so I think uh, super apps are amazingly convenient. You have an ability to do multiple different things. Uh, but you know, there's an old adage that says it goes something like you can be a jack of all trades and master of none, right? Uh, as you become more discerning, as 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 technology evolves, uh, my view is people would want to do specific things with specific apps, and for all the other things, you may use a app, right? So uh, you may not be able to, for example, I mean, I'll, I'll take a you know just off the top of my head, a music app working together with a taxi hailing app. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, you know, completely different uh, ways. And so within within a super app, also there are completely different things that happen. Uh, and and do you want to go to best of breed, or do you want to go to just anything? Uh, you know, that brings everything together. Both have value, right? In certain cases, you want to go one place where everything is available, and you don't have to worry about you know going five different places. But for other aspects, you may want a, a more best of breed approach. And there you may want to go to very specific apps and say, hey, this is best of breed for wealth management as an example, versus sending money overseas. Uh, while they could potentially be together, but will I really trust my wealth with an app that, uh, you know, hails a taxi as an example? Exactly, right? yeah. So, so there is that aspect. And, and so for certain things, I think aggregation is great. And for certain things, best of breed is also equally important. So, and the world will go through these waves. In certain cases, we'll aggregate. In certain cases, we'll really centralize. That's just uh, one person's view. Yeah, no, I'd love to, to add on to that because this is a topic that's really close to, to uh, what we do, right? We, we try to be the all-in-one business finance app for, for small, medium businesses. Um, and, you know, we think about this a lot. I, I think, you know, you, you certainly have seen... Uh, fintechs, financial plays, sort of doing that, that vertical specialization that, that Anupam has mentioned. Uh, and, and there's also, you know, others like us who, who try to, you know, aggregate uh, the services in a convenient uh, way. And, and I think one of the things that is, is interesting uh, when you think about the aggregation is that it, it can also lend to building a reliability or a trust layer with this, with this aggregated you know, third yeah. party, right? Uh, and and I think that's that's one of the interesting things. I mean, aside from the other, you know, uh, obvious things, which is like you know your your economies of scale, better pricing, and and, and so on. Uh, but but I think that's that's one area that we we find to be quite interesting. Shut up. I think from my perspective, the way I look at it is uh, uh, embedded finance still remains as one of the uh, key areas of development. Um, open banking and some of these uh, uh, capabilities for uh, embedded finance to be enabled into these different types of apps, Peter e-commerce platforms and all, still remains uh, as one of the key, I would say, uh, trends that that we see, especially, you know, we we did a report on navigating the world of embedded finance earlier this year, and it did talk about how APAC embedded finance is 
expected to grow at a 20 plus digit percentage for the next five years. Um, of course, um, I, I do share the opinion that Anupam also has on you know how it's for us to see whether really super apps would would continue to grow in that way. But but there is definitely an opportunity right now, and we can see that trend evolving across other countries as well. In fact, there are companies uh, I was told which are actually creating super apps as well. So one of them is part of our uh, our, our uh, association as well as a member uh, called Boxo, and they specialize in turning normal apps into super apps. Um, and they have offices in Singapore and uh, other five places as well. Wow. Yeah, so so fascinating. I mean, listen, everybody, this has been a a really fascinating discussion. Um, definitely makes me want to move back to Singapore in the sun as I'm sitting here in the, in a, in a dungeon in the basement in a cold in a cold London. Um, so, I sort of a final question going around the panel, um, and this is a slightly, slightly more light light hearted. Um, certainly, one of the things that I miss the most about Singapore is the food. You know, we're talking about situating in Singapore. You can't, you just cannot, you know, you talk about that without the food. If I was traveling to Singapore now on a business trip, which restaurant should I visit? What is the one restaurant when you're like, wow, that just, that just takes the cake for, for food in Singapore for me. Anyone want to jump in? I'll go. Um, go on, Joel. It's not a restaurant. I'd, I'd, I'd recommend you visit East Coast beach there's a hawker center there it's oh yes yeah for me it checks all the boxes you you're by the seaside and you get the best of the local food chili crab <laughs> yeah so, so my kids are both in the u.s uh, they're in college and the minute they land back in singapore the first stop is boon Ki, uh, which is our chicken rice place uh, on uh, um, and, and uh you know that's the first meal if they, if they don't have it it's uh, no trip to singapore is complete oh my god salivating <laughs> and given we are talking to the business listeners here, I would say I would put my tick to uh, the La Passat, which is basically right in the middle of CBD and it's got multiple, easily like 70, 80 options of various local foods there. So you will never run out of choice, even if you're here for a three month assignment. Amazing. And on that, on that note, thank you to the three of you. That wraps up today's discussion. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Where can people find out more about you? Let's start with you, Anupam. Well, you can find me on LinkedIn. Connect with me on LinkedIn. It's Anupam Pahuja is the name. And uh, look at me up on the website, Niam's website, www.niam.com. Awesome. And Joel? Yep. Joel Young, uh, also on LinkedIn. And we're also at aspireapp.com. Amazing. And shut up. Uh, LinkedIn, of course, Shadab Tayabi is the name. And you can also find out more information at www.singaporefintech.org. Amazing. And you can find me also on LinkedIn at David BG. Thanks for listening, everyone. If you like what you've heard, follow our podcast and don't forget to leave us a review. It helps us to make it better and helps others find the show. As always, if you want to join the conversation, find us on social media. Just search for 11FS or Fintech Insider or email podcasts at 11FS.com. Thanks very much and goodbye. Whether you're starting or scaling your company security program, demonstrating top-notch security practices and establishing trust is more important than ever. Vanta automates compliance for ISO 27001, SOC 2, GDPR and more, saving you time and money while helping you build customer trust. Plus, you can streamline security reviews by automating questionnaires and demonstrating your security posture with a customer-facing trust center, all powered by Vanta AI. Over 7,000 global companies like Atlassian, Flow Health, and Cora use Vanta to manage risk and prove security in real time. Our audience gets a special offer of $1,000 off Vanta at vanta.com forward slash insider. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com forward slash insider for $1,000 off.